up to the official secret sack being the postmistress anyway, but she just wouldn't say anything about it. So her sort of secrets went to went to the grave with yeah, her? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Any? She didn't uh, tell us all. So you want us to find out exactly what she was up to? Yeah, I'd like you to find out to what extent she was involved in it. She was also supposed to have been on Hitler's death list, but whether that's true or not, that's another thing I'd like to know. So what sort of a woman was Mabel Brenner? What do you remember of her? I used to spend a lot of time with her, listening to Listen With Mother. When did she become renowned for being a spy mistress? Every so often it crops up and then there's a, like they put the plaque in, the, in this high street above the post office. Uh, loads of people come then asking questions and the radio and all sorts. So to put everything to rest, to actually sort everything out, would probably be a bit of a relief to it you. Would would it would be, yeah, because it might sort it out once and for all. Yeah. So specifically, was Brennan's gran actually involved in Churchill's undercover spy ring, the auxiliary service? Was she really a spy herself, or was she just a postmistress? Or might the truth lie somewhere in between? We need to find out exactly what she did do, but how did she begin to investigate a secret organisation? So we're on the trail of a silver-haired postmistress. Oh, it's a fascinating story, isn't it? Isn't it? I'd love yeah. to know what she was up to. Let's say you were Churchill. Would you really want a pensioner to be running a spy operation? Absolutely. I think it's fantastic cover. Nobody would suspect this innocent, grey-haired little lady behind her counter. I think it's great. I mean, it just seems unlikely. It's a beautiful English market town, isn't it? It seems like the Second quaint. World War never happened here. Yeah, but it did, and it's all undercover from the post office with Mabel. And we need to get Nicky... According to Brennan, there seems to be a reason behind the speculation about Mabel's involvement with the auxiliary unit. As postmistress at Highworth, it was her job to send new recruits arriving for training to the secret headquarters at nearby Coles Hill House. Nick starts his investigation into Coles Hill at the National Archives in London because some of the files relating to secret organisations from the Second World War are generally declassified after 30 years and held here. Let's slip away and have a look around here, shall we? Now we're really getting into our covert mission. While Jonathan goes in search of Mabel Strax's post office, I do some intelligence gathering of my own on the internet. The People's War website is a rich source of information and a great place to find individuals and organisations associated with the Second World War. Brennan has told me where to find Highworth's old post office, where his gran worked. It's since been used as a shop, now the builders are in and it's covered in scaffolding, so I've no idea what I'll be able to find. But it's easy to spot the brown plaque Brennan told us about, commemorating Mabel's life. It describes the old post office as the auxiliary unit's gateway. wonder what that means. Maybe there are still some clues about what went on here inside. So what did Mabel Strang see when she turned up for work here, of sorts, during the Second World War? Well, this door certainly predates the Second World War. I can tell that because it's a really solid piece, but also it's because the builders are in and they've partly stripped it. And I can see characteristic colours on the door frame. That black there, Victorians love black. Think of Victorian and mourning colour. It's a very popular colour then. But during the interwar period between 20s, 30s, sage green was really popular. And that's the colour that overlays the black. It's all working well for the kind of colours and tones you'd expect. So that's the interwar green that I would suspect that Mabel Stranks would have seen a green door when she arrived for work here in the 40s. <laughs> During the war, a small post office like this would also have housed the telephone exchange. And it was where ration books were issued. The post office in Highworth relocated from here soon after the war. It's been a shop premises since then, and it looks as if the only sign of its former use is that modern plaque outside. I can see very little of Mabel Strang's life here, so when I report back to Brennan and say, well, this is what I found of your grandmother, it isn't going to be a great deal here, sadly. Jonathan's found no evidence of Mabel Stranks at the post office. Fortunately, my internet search has paid off and I've tracked down Graham Tanner, president of the Highworth Historical Society. He was a teenager during the war here in Highworth. I wonder what he remembers of Mabel from her days as the postmistress. Yes, I knew Mabel well enough. I mean, I had two particular instances. Uh, one, my sister asked me to 
A, post one letter and B, deliver the other. And of course, as usual, I did them the wrong way round. So I wasn't popular in that respect. And uh, I was also interested in a badge called the World Friendship Badge. I wanted to use registered post. Oh dear, Mabel didn't take very kindly to a 13-year-old uh, wanting to do this. She was really sort of out of time. She was still very Victorian in her approach, A, in authority and B, in her dress. So it sounds as if Graham has a rather different view of Brennan's grey-haired granny. But who better to have fronting a secret organisation than someone who believes in a code of practice and follows rules to the letter? What was it like living here with that constant threat of invasion? September of 1940, particularly when the invasion was expected, and some places went on to immediate alert over it. I mean, there was at least one person killed in Hyrath by the Home Guard. Talking to Graham is giving me a new insight into Mabel Stranks and her time at Highworth Post Office. But like Brennan, he knows nothing about her role in the auxiliary units. However, he does have something that shows just how big a threat German invasion was at the beginning of the Second World War. Well, it's one of the three publications which the German forces produced for the invasion of Britain. Right. Um, this is the landing areas on the south coast of Britain illustrated by photographs and maps, some of the photographs taken by Germany. After the fall of France in June 1940, Adolf Hitler ordered his generals to organise the invasion of Britain. The invasion plan was given the code name Operation Sea Lion, and the objective? To land hundreds of thousands of German soldiers along the southeast coast of England. It's really beginning to hit home just how real the threat of a German invasion was. So this is a book for the German troops, yeah. giving them information yeah. about areas that would have been invaded had they actually got to the southern coast. Because this all could have been a reality oh, very indeed. easily, couldn't yes, it? Indeed. And from the coast, the German forces would have pushed towards the Midlands and Britain's industrial heartland, bringing them into the area around Highworth. No wonder Churchill focused the centre of his civilian-based resistance movement right here. The question is, what exactly would the auxiliary units do? And what was Mabel's role in all this? Jonathan and I need to compare notes and decide what our next step will be. So how was the post office? I was hoping for counter-espionage, you know? Yeah, totally. It's not even a counter, nothing. It's really disappointing, actually. What, what did you find out? But Miranda's research confirms that the old post office was the contact address for Coles Hill House, the training centre and HQ of Churchill's top-secret resistance operation. It's time to shift our operation from Highworth to Coles Hill, less than three miles away. And just seeing, if you've got Coles Hill here, this is a tiny, tiny little village, but it's surrounded by a huge amount of land. Um, and to take emphasis away from people turning up here, they were sent first to Highworth. Because you're taking suspicion away from Coles Hill, but what's there? That's what I need to know next, you see, because that, if that's a centre of operations that Mabel Strang is sending people to, because Brennan's asked me to do a reconstruction of what it was like in his grandmother's lifetime. Well, that's where we should go next. Coles Hill House was the nerve centre of British resistance in World War II. Civilians recruited for training would arrive first at Highworth Post Office, a decoy address, and Mabel Stranks would then arrange for them to be taken on to Coles Hill. But did her involvement go any further than this? Was Mabel somehow engaged in the spy training itself, as speculation suggests? This is why Brennan wants to know more about Coles Hill and the secret training that went on there. And we've got our work cut out for us, because we're investigating a secret organisation at a house that's since burnt down. While Jonathan heads off in search of Second World War Coles Hill, I've got to rendezvous with Bill King. He's an amateur historian who Graham has put me in touch with, and he knows a lot about the auxiliary unit's training. He's brought along a few gadgets to show me, and they don't look friendly. We've got a veritable Aladdin's cave of quite um, scary looking equipment here actually. Um, um, talk me through. Uh, actually, what, should we start with this? Uh, okay, this is, this is a wireless set number 17 Mark II. It was the kind of radio equipment that was issued to the auxiliars. 
So these things would have been in various different hides all over the country. And inside, of course, there's the original radio. And from it, of course, you need an aerial yeah. uh, to be able to transmit. And so they buried the aerials in, in the trunks of the trees by removing a segment of the bark and then putting the aerial in and then putting the bark back over the top. The uh, interesting thing about these also is many clergymen had these in the crypts of their churches <laughs> because <laughs> clergymen were recruited into the auxiliary units of as course. well. Yes. yes. Right, moving on to the, yes. the slightly more sinister stuff as well. What have we got here? Well, Tommy basically, Green. if we start near, near you, yep. um, we have demolitions equipment. These are fuses, waterproof fuses. There's a full box of them there. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, this is original fuse. This is called slow fuse. And it's the kind of thing you see in cowboy pictures where they connect up the fuse to the explosives. Light one end. Light the match, and it's, it fizzes around. <laughs> what have we got here? What's this, this is trip wire. The idea of the different colors is you can lay this yellow wire out there in the grass, and you can't see it right. against the light green background. These look like the weapons of a guerrilla army to me. Is that effectively what these auxiliary units were being trained as? Every terrorist organisation that there's ever been since World War II has actually got some uh, things that can trace back to the way the British organised our resistance organisation. Small groups of seven to eight people who didn't know people outside their group and nobody from outside the group knew them. Coles Hill House burned down in 1952, and a box hedge is all that marks the perimeter of where the house once stood. Well, it's a start, but it doesn't tell me much about what the house actually looked like. A quick scan around the site, however, yields a clue in the most unlikely place. Curious, this pool here. It's got very odd-shaped stones around it. Oh, you beauty! Look at the quality of the carving. You see, this is the kind of stuff that any uh, gentleman architect of the 17th century worth his salt would either be studying in Italy or he'd be looking at it in engraved pattern books. It's supposed to be seen. It's expensive work. Did it surround a very smart window? Did it surround a door? Be a very smart one. Maybe even a principal entrance. <laughs> Even though the house itself no longer exists, there are still some outbuildings here, which might just hold some evidence of the Second World War. I head off on a reconnaissance mission and find more than I bargained for. Where would you... Oh, there. That's interesting. I was going to say, where would you find a space that's usable as offices, for example, for a secret organisation? Well, there's some stairs here. Oh, now that's interesting. Look at that, now we're in World War II. That's the first thing I've seen of the Second World War in this whole complex, and it's when I'm already behind closed doors. Look, look RE, Royal Engineers Office. <laughs> that's beautiful. Typists, here is the typing pool. You'd never guess it. It looks like a, an ostler's or stable boy's lodging from the outside. But in here, presumably, there'd be the ring of, of, of typewriters churning out paper. Maybe it's from Churchill, maybe it's straight from the cabinet offices in Whitehall. Who knows? But there's information crucial to the defence of the nation that's being created in this room, which today, look at this. This is a monument to Britain's salvation in the war, but look, it's a junk store now. <laughs> Now we're getting somewhere. Time to go a bit deeper, literally. This was a tunnel running 10 feet below our feet. Bill shows me an operational base right here in the grounds of Coles Hill. This one was used for training. These hideouts were built underground and strategically situated up and down the country. They were a secure base from which auxiliars could plan and act out their guerrilla tactics in the event of a German invasion. What can it tell me about the people Mabel sent here? The idea of the operational basis was that it could accommodate the patrol of about eight to ten men. And you can imagine eight to ten men being cooped up down here for maybe a couple of weeks behind enemy lines, emerging up through the ladder and out into the woodland, for instance, and then crawling off across countryside at night to do as much damage as they possibly could to the enemy before they themselves were caught. The whole idea of this 
secret organisation was that nobody knew anything about it except the patrol members themselves. They weren't allowed to think to their family at all about the organisation that they were part of. And if the enemy had arrived, then they would be given a code word, and when they received the code word, then they would converge on their operational base, and they would disappear from the community. Now I have a clearer sense of what the auxiliars were training to be. A secret army made up of ordinary people whose mission it was to hamper the advance of an occupying German force if Britain were ever invaded. Jonathan's making some headway with his reconstruction of Coles Hill House for Brennan, but we still haven't found any hard evidence linking Mabel to the underground movement that trained here. We've got quite a wide idea of what was going on here, but we really need to narrow it down. We need to just hone everything down and think about how Mabel fits into the whole picture. And I need a lucky break if I'm going to get Brennan the information he's after. Nick's been digging away at the archives in London and has found a couple of leads. We arranged to meet up at Highworth Cemetery where Mabel's buried to see if her gravestone has any clues. Unfortunately, it's as silent as she was during her lifetime. So what has Nick uncovered? I have found something at the post office archives, so we can confirm she worked at Highworth Post Office. In fact, she was there from 1916, so a very long period of time. Now, it does put her in the right place at the right time. So that actually doesn't tell us very much about her at all, but you've got a whole wodge of information there. What else did you find out? <laughs> well, at least the National Archives had a few files. Now, this is a file. Top secret! Top secret! And it details the work of the auxiliary units based at Coles Hill. That's where the signals unit was based, and of course the key to resistance is communications, mm -hmm. and so they would have been in charge of coordinating all the activities up and down the country as and when the Germans moved inland. So even though we can't as, as yet pinpoint Mabel's role in that operation, Coles Hill itself was effectively the heart of Resistance Britain. And you found it, um, documents linking Highworth and Coles Hill directly? Absolutely, yes. All of the communications come out of Highworth there's their telephone number, and again, you've got files that list Highworth and Coles Hill together. So the two are intertwined. Well, what's puzzling me is the fact that just because we haven't got any documents showing that Mabel Stranks was a spy, I mean, maybe those documents have been destroyed, maybe they are still out there somewhere, we just haven't found them. That's quite right. That's one of the frustrations with working with archive material. The paper tray will only get you so far, and that's why it's so important that you need to go to oral history to try and fill in these gaps, try and find people who were alive at the time of the Second World War who can perhaps give personal information about what Mabel was up to. So it sounds like my next job is to go and fill in the gaps with a bit of oral history. I think what your next job is definitely is to go and find this hit list. Now, Brennan was really specific. He wanted to know whether Mabel Stranks' name was on Hitler's hit list. So where could you go to try and find that? I guess the Imperial War Museum might be another place to have a look at. So Nick heads back to London to search for Hitler's death list. Meanwhile, with just a few stones left of the original Coles Hill house, I'm going to need a little more to go on if I'm going to get this reconstruction right. I head over to the National Monuments record in Swindon for more conclusive evidence in the form of plans and photographs. There was one series of stones surrounding the pool. I was looking at yesterday. I'm looking for what those carved stones were. Look, that's exactly it. Look, look around the door, these same mouldings. And the photograph, I was touching a block of stone, which looks like it came from about there, around the main door. So it was the door. And what a beautiful house it was. An impressive Cromwellian stately home. It was built between 1649 and 1662 by a student of Inigo Jones, the famous architect who designed Covent Garden. Brennan is going to be knocked out. Now, if you have a country house near you of which there is virtually no trace, you can come to places like this and you can pick up all kinds of visual material with which to piece together all of the bits of evidence that can help you recreate, at least on paper, what that great country house near you looked like. I'm drawing floor plans of Coles Hill House from a variety of survey drawings and photos. It's a really useful way to understand a building from the ground up. 
and it's about to present me with a surprise. Can you see that downstairs there's a sunken room within the cellar, but that at the end of the corridor you go into another series of rooms which are not the cellar dug out to take the main block of the house. So this is beyond the house itself. So there are extra cellars, and you would never guess that there's more of a subterranean warren under there. What were they used for? Might they still be there? Now, those plans have really got me thinking. What are my chances of finding that underground warren? Could it have been used by or even built by the auxiliars? Is it still there? Or was it filled in? The place to look is Coleshill, so I sneak back for a rummage. Hey, now. Oh. Come and have a look at this. Come and have a look at this little beauty. It's a stone rubble built wall. There are two bits of flagstone. There's a step going down. It's an entrance to an underground room. That's what it is. Looks like it's a, a handrail or something. Now, if that's a if that's right, that piece of iron pole, that's a bit of 20th century kit right there. It's tantalising. Somewhere under my feet lies an underground room, and that iron rail proves it must have been used in the 20th century. What a find! But time marches on, and I need to finish off my reconstruction of the house for Brennan. Nick's advice, I've hunted for Coles Hill veterans on the People's War website and I've got lucky. Eric Gray was stationed there. He now lives in Hertfordshire and he agrees to meet me. I really hope he'll have the information we're after about our postmistress, Mabel Stranks. Can I just find out a bit more about what you did at Coles Hill when you were there? What was your job? Well, my main job was uh, replying to letters sent in by the intelligence officers over the country who were queries and they're on transport. Now, Mabel Stranks, she was the postmistress at Highworth. Did you ever meet her? Did you have any involvement or any connection with her at all? No, I only saw the shattery figure in the background. <laughs> what was her job? It was purely as a, as a contact purely a point. postmistress, yes, contact office. Anybody arrived, she was told to ring through and say who it was and to leave it to us. That was all I was to it. According to Eric, Mabel Stranks was not a spy, nor did she have anything to do with the training at Coles Hill House. It looks as if she was simply a postmistress who didn't ask awkward questions. I'm relieved we finally have something conclusive to tell Brennan, although we're still having no luck tracking down Hitler's death list. While I find out how Nick's doing on that front, Jonathan cracks on with his painting. Having collected all of my evidence, I finally get to complete Brennan's reconstruction of Coles Hill as it looked during the Second World War. Right, the finishing touch with this painting, it's, <laughs> it's a great personal risk, it's make or break, but my trees in the foreground need some foliage, lots of leaves, haven't got hours to paint them on, it's splash time. I think that's all right. Let's see what Brennan thinks. Hello, boys. Well then, rendezvous point. <laughs> rendezvous point. Absolutely. At last, Nick says he has a gem for us, and we all meet up to pool our resources before feeding back to Brennan. Maybe. I've arranged something to enhance our experience about Coles Hill and what happened here during the war, but we're just going to have to sit and wait for it, I'm afraid. What neither of them realise is that I have a little something up my sleeve as well. Okay. That, that may be going on. Jonathan smiling. <laughs> This is a Humber Snipe, the sort of army staff car that would have ferried the trainee auxiliars from Highworth to Coles Hill House. Now that we're travelling Second World War style, I'm dying to hear what Nick's found out. Yeah, we need to actually review what we're going to talk to Brennan about, so who's you going to go first? Well, yes, I've gone back to the archives and, as I thought, Imperial War Museum came up trumps. This Excellent. is Hitler's hit list. <gasps> it lists all the people, places, institutions that if he invaded, should be knocked out, eliminated and eradicated. Who's in there? Well... Strengths. 
that's the thing, <laughs> she's not. And yeah. here are the S's. Um, there is no Mabel Stranks or any Stranks at all. No. Who is on the list, though? Well, all the great and the good. I mean, there's Neville Chamberlain. <laughs> and there, a little bit further down, is the man himself. Winston Churchill! Minister President, <laughs> Prime Minister. So it does cover everybody who was deemed important. That's amazing. So reading into that, I think we have to finally put the myth of Mabel's involvement to bed. There is no great spy story. Well, this absolutely backs up with the interview that I had with this chap, Eric, who said the whole Mabel fable is, in fact, a fabricated <laughs> story. It's become a very elaborated over the years. She was merely a gateway from Highworth to Coles Hill, and that's all her role was. So it's a Mabel fable, but there's thanks to Stranks. <laughs> telling that. I know Brennan said he didn't mind whether his gram was really a spy or not, but we're both anxious that he'll be disappointed. How will he react to the news of the but, Mabel um, fable? How, how do you feel now? We finally, hopefully, we've, we've put the whole story to rest. I feel tell like tell that, me how you're feeling. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's good. If it's finally finished, she was my gran. That's what she was to me. I didn't expect her to be anything else. And that's, uh, that's why I'm relieved that there's nothing more to it. <laughs> Brennan's gran, Mabel Stranks, was not a spy, but it doesn't diminish her role in the war effort. Her job as the gateway to Coles Hill and her silence protected the anonymity of many men and women who would have been in grave and immediate danger had the Germans ever invaded these shores. For a free pack of history postcards and information on how to solve your own history mystery, call 0870 900 03 or go to open2.net, where you can also find out more about other Open University programmes. For a free pack of history postcards and information on other Open University programmes, call 0870 900 0303 or go to open2.net.